Yo, I'm Bob. Into Marvel. Happened to be totally blind since birth. Talking about X-Men, the animated series, season 2, episodes 3 and 4. Or episodes 16 and 17 of the show overall. They are Whatever It Takes and Red Dawn. Whatever It Takes premiered on November 6th in 1993, and Red Dawn premiered on November 13th in 1993. Spoilers ahead, if you haven't seen the episodes, watch them if you don't want to get spoiled. However, if you don't mind spoilery, spoilery recaps slash reviews, then come right along anyway. That being said, jumping in, and you were warned. So these aren't necessarily standalone episodes because we've got a lot going on in this episode. A lot that picks up from where the last episode, Till Death Do Us Part, Part 2, leaves off. We've got Wolverine and he's headed to the Amazon to track down Morph, trying to get him to come home. You've got consequences from Bishop's time traveling in Days of Future Past, Parts 1 and 2, repercussions from that. And uh, you've got Storm being released from the hospital. And she apparently threatened to flood the kitchen if the staff didn't release her, according to Rogue. And it's quite a comedic line there. I can imagine Storm doing that. Uh, anybody would probably go a bit stir-crazy in the, in the hospital if they were there for an extended period of time. So I like that right off the bat, the X-Men are searching for Professor Xavier when we see them. Um, because, of course, he hasn't returned from his little adventure in Antarctica. He's still there with Magneto. We'll see them at the end of the episode. We get to see Storm's godson, Mijinari, in this episode. And I like how he's the only one he, who can see that the astral plane is tearing open. And we also get to see the Shadow King for the first time. He is voiced by Maurice Dean Wint. And I love this voice actor's performance as the Shadow King. He also voices Onslaught, a very memorable bad guy from the comics. If you played Marvel vs. Capcom 1, you're listening to Maurice Dean Wint voicing Onslaught. So I like that he voices two titanic uh, psychic characters in the Marvel Universe. Such a great voice that this guy has. And when we hear Shadow King chuckling as he emerges from the astral plane, I mean, they pitched his voice way down, but it is a very unearthly, demonic chuckle. And uh, it, it creeped me out a bit seeing this for the first time at around age 10. Man, did they ever pitch this guy's voice down. And so, of course, he possesses Storm's godson, and he's going to try to lure her to Africa so he can take over her body and become uh, Cairo's criminal mastermind yet again. Shadow King, I hope we get to see him in X-Men 97. We see him in this episode, and we also see him in Xavier Remembers later on. He's just such an interesting bad guy. I learned not too long ago that, of course, longtime comic fans know that he's some sort of multiverse spanning entity with tendrils seeping into each universe. So I guess this is kind of an offshoot of the Shadow King. I it, it I'm not really sure what this guy is made of. I mean, we do know he was a criminal mastermind at one point, um, but now he is apparently something else. Who knows? In this universe, it might not be a multiverse-spanning entity. But I love that bit of lore about this character. I kind of hope eventually this entity is uh, eventually going to be made Onslaught because it would be cool to uh, to see this thing back in uh, in X-Men 97. I don't know how they're going to spin this character, but um, I also like seeing Wolverine tracking down Morph in the episode. We spend a goodish amount of time with Wolvie in the Amazon. You know, he, he actually finds Morph, and Morph is very sadistic, playing with Wolverine's mind. I guess Wolverine has confided in Morph at one point, um, I would imagine talking to him about how he feels about Jean. And now, of course, since Morph is under Sinister's control, Morph is using this to psych Wolverine out, turning into Jean, attempting to get Wolverine to leave him alone, you know. Um, then they have this really cool fight in the mineshaft. I think Morph is 
he's, he turns into um, a centaur, I think. He turns into Sabretooth. And he knows that Xavier is gone. I wonder if Wolverine has picked up on that. Morph is aware that Xavier uh, has left the X-Men and that he hasn't come home yet. Because as, as Sabretooth, he says, without Xavier, there are no X-Men. And of course, he eventually does leave. And Wolverine lets him go because Morph tells him, you don't get it. I need to get through this by myself. He's very much trying to break free of Mr. Sinister's control, but he feels like he's, at least in my opinion, too much of a danger to the team. And he just kind of runs off. And Wolverine, I like how he is actually showing empathy in this episode. Um, he's desperate to save his friend. And, I mean, he tries to come off as a character who, you know, is, is heartless. He's grumpy all the time, um, gets angry, but uh, he does have quite a heart for those he's close to. And so it's, uh, it's quite a cool bit of action in this episode. And it's also neat to see him doing the best that he can to try and bring his friend home. And he cares about him enough to try and let him get through this by himself. So I like how the majority of the episode focuses on Rogue and Storm. I mean, they are our main protagonists in this episode. We do get that bit of B story with Wolverine looking for Morph, but you know, they, they have to go to Africa because that's where the disturbance is. And we learn that, you know, Storm was taken in by these villagers and how she helped Shawnee give birth to her son Mijinari and, and how you know Storm was basically this kid's godmother. And it's such a cool scene. Um, it's just another instance as to why Storm was one of my favorite characters. She was a butt-kicking youngster. Uh, she managed to overcome uh, Shadow King's influence, um, you know, when he was human before he was banished to the astral plane by Xavier. Now, of course, he's back. And um, you know how it goes. The the Shadow King decides to leave Mijinari and Storm is possessed by him. It doesn't last too long, though. She's got this really awesome idea to expel him by, you know, going up so high that there's no air to breathe. So he kind of flies right out of her. But um, as for what this thing looks like since he's basically an entity now he he doesn't have a physical body anymore i i i would love to know that there's this one part after he emerges from storm and he is all kinds of ticked off uh Mijinari's the only one who can see the entrance to the astral plane and uh shadow king's like for refusing me i will make you suffer and then he like i don't know goes all monstery <laughs> <laughs> they really pitch his voice down crazy low here. We get that we get more of that demonic chuckling as he is chasing chasing Mijinari through the uh through the astral plane and of course they seal it up again. Um I give this episode a 10 out of 10, especially the ending because we get to see Xavier and Magneto. They're of course all right and they find themselves in the the savage land. This is our first time uh, in which we get to see the savage land mr sinister i think we might get a cameo of him at the end of the episode too he i think releases some sky riders and i guess he's recovering from his um optic blast funsies in the previous episode and of course the episode ends on another on another cliffhanger because these two go over a waterfall and um yeah we, we go right into red dawn the episode picks up where whatever it takes leaves off. And uh, I really like the beginning of the episode because we get these guys depending on each other. They make it over the falls okay. And Magneto, he is very much confused as to why Xavier keeps saving him. And Xavier, I like how he tells him, well, I don't wish you dead at all. Um, that's not what I'm about at all. And of course, then they're attacked. I think it's by a T-Rex. And Magneto, even though he doesn't have his mutant powers, I like how he uses his ingenuity, his wit, to get the two out of a very bad situation. Um, so this episode, we get to see the Friends of Humanity very briefly, so they show back up here. Not very much. It mostly focuses on Omega Red being freed in Russia. And 
boy, this character, I loved his action figure when I was a kid because, you know, he's got those carbonadium coils. I didn't know that when I was a kid, he could apparently drain the life force of other mutants. It's kind of how he survives because the, the, uh, the carbonadium is poisoning him. So he's got to drain mutants or I guess anyone he can in order to survive. We don't see that in the TV show, but I like that little bit of Omega Red's history from the comics. And we get to see Colossus in the episode because he's trying to uh, get back to Russia. Uh, his family has, is separated and of course, uh, you know, his, uh, his home is destroyed. I guess he's looking for the X-Men yet again. I don't think Colossus has met Xavier yet because um, in in the last episode we saw him in, the Unstoppable Juggernaut, Charles was absent in that one, and here he is going again. And Jubilee's got to go with him to Russia in order to you know, help out if she can. I like how she just drops everything, and uh, she hops in. I think it's a mini jet. And of course, I think this is her first time actually flying it outside of simulators. So I'm glad they managed to make it to Russia. She'd do a heck of a lot better than I would in that situation. Um... I really liked Wolverine showing up after they left and he finds the note and we learn that Wolverine, since Wolverine is, is very old, uh, he's had history with Omega Red as well, actually tangled with him years ago. I guess we get a bit of a flashback scene when he gets to Russia and we, when he talks to uh, Jubilee and Colossus about this particular happenstance here. Uh, but like I said, no audio description in these older TV shows. So, I mean, I'm just kind of listening to Wolverine and Omega Red fighting during Logan narrating the flashback there. Um, so the episode does end with more of the X-Men showing up to, um, to Russia. I guess we get to see Rogue and Storm yet again. They, they come back from Africa. I think they gather Gambit and I think that might be all that, that's there. I think Rogue Storm and maybe Gambit. And they actually show up and they've got to do battle with Omega Red yet again. He's just flinging those carbonadium coils or tentacles around. Um, I think this is the only episode in which we get to see Darkstar. I would have liked to have seen more of her in X-Men, the animated series. Um, we do get to see Omega Red again later on. And he's, he's an awesome character, a really intriguing villain. So I was glad he showed up again. But this is the last appearance of Colossus. Hopefully he'll show up in X-Men 97, um, like the ending of the episode where they have to rely on Storm to freeze Omega Red on a block of ice yet again. No cliffhanger at the end of this episode, but uh, everything is... Okay-ish. Um, I think Colossus and his family, they've still got a lot of work to do. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think that a very young uh, Tara Strong is doing the voice of Colossus' sister, Ileana, in this episode. I don't know that for sure. I've, I've seen some people saying yes, some people saying no. It sounds like, um, it sounds like Tara Strong to me, but I'm, I'm not going to swear to that. <laughs> So yeah, like I said in the last video, I really enjoy these episodes because we're not focusing on the entire team. We're getting to focus on the X-Men and little tidbits. You know, we got to focus on Storm in the last episode. We got to see a bit of her history in this episode. Well, we kind of got a bit of, you know, everybody. We got Jubilee having a, a little adventure with Colossus. We got to see a bit more of Wolverine's history, uh, what he was up to when he tangled with Omega Red the first time. And we get to see a bit of Rogue and Storm toward the end of the episode. Wolverine, man, he's, uh, he's in a lot of these episodes, even though there's a big chunk of a story in whatever it takes. I mean, the writers just had to throw him in there, but I like that though, because they're following up with uh, what they what they started at the end of Till Death Do Us Part Part Two, where he goes off to look for Morph, and so he goes from being unsuccessful looking for Morph, and then he's got to go all the way to Russia and tangle with Omega Red. So this guy's a busy, busy Wolvie, and we'll be focusing on him quite a bit in the next video. We're going to be talking about Repo Man, no, not the Genetic Opera, and externally yours, two more of my favorite episodes from season two. So be here for those next time. 
And until next time, true believer, have an excellent day. <laughs> yes, my puns are horrible, but, um, well, what are you going to do?